Welcome back. Wednesday, May 5th, 2021. Axios reports that Facebook's Independent Oversight Board upheld Facebook's suspension of former President Trump's account, but told the social media giant to rethink the ban's indefinite nature. The decision sets a global precedent for how Facebook and potentially other social media companies will treat political leaders around the world, Axios reports. The board found Trump's posts had, quote, severely violated Facebook rules. It is not permissible for Facebook to keep a user off the platform for an undefined period, however, is what the board found. In response to the ruling, Facebook's vice president of global affairs and communications, Nick Clegg, said the platform, quote, will now consider the board's decision and determine an action that is clear and proportionate. In the meantime, Mr. Trump's accounts remain suspended, close quote. Facebook, like Twitter, barred Trump for violating its rules in the aftermath of the January 6th Capitol riot, then referred the case to its own board. While Twitter was Trump's chief online megaphone, Facebook was his most effective fundraising tool. The Spectator editorializes this way, The Facebook Oversight Board looks a bit like the UN. Its members hail from 16 different countries. Five of the members are American, and it is a mix of journalists, judges, academics, NGO chiefs, and human rights activists. It is the very model of diversity these days. It counts, amongst its, uh, it counts among its co-chairs a Columbia law professor and a professor of law from Columbia. That sexy Danish prime minister who flirted with Barack Obama at Nelson Mandela's funeral and married Neil Kinnock's son, is also there, as is former Guardian editor and current Oxford Don Alan Roosbridger. Glad that someone on the board has the working man's back. As far as we can tell, conservatives are represented on the 20-member committee by one person, Michael McConnell, a never-Trumper. If you were picking a dream lineup of globalists to slow walk an extrajudicial process and drain the passion from a politically charged situation through the magic of bureaucracy, you could do worse than the Facebook Oversight Board. Two quick points for the record. One, if you go to the homepage of the website for the Facebook Oversight Board, the very first thing you see is a splash that reads, quote, ensuring respect for free expression through independent judgment, close quote. Two, Facebook, as true of Twitter, has pages today for Ayatollahs Khomeini and Khamenei and Louis Farrakhan, people who have defamed homosexuals and Jews and called for genocide. In the first instance of the Facebook website declaration, Facebook clearly has a different dic dictionary than we do. Quote, ensuring respect, ensuring respect for free expression, close quote, is Orwellian opposite to former president of the United States banned. As Orwell puts it, quote, political language has to consist largely of euphemism, question begging, and cloudy vagueness. The great enemy of clear language is insincerity. Where there is a gap between one's real and one's declared aims, one turns, as it were, instinctively to long words and exhausted idioms. Close quote. He goes on. If thought corrupts language, language can also corrupt thought. A bad usage can spread by tradition and imitation even among people who should and do know better. Edwin Herman puts it this way, quote, what is really important in the world of doublespeak is the ability to lie, whether knowingly or unconsciously, and to get away with it, and the ability to use lies and choose and shape facts selectively, blocking out those that don't fit an agenda or program, close quote. Facebook, Twitter, all of social media clearly have an agenda and program and thus the ability to change the meanings of words and to lie. So in the dispensation of the day, respect for free expression means banning a former president of the United States. And so we are reminded, quote, it was an enormous pyramidal structure of glittering white concrete soaring up terrace after 
terrace 300 meters into the air from where Winston stood. It was just possible to read, picked out on its white face in elegant lettering, the three slogans of the party. War is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. Let's be clear that we now know why Ralph Waldo, em Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote a man's power to connect his thought with its proper symbol and so to utter it depends on the simplicity of his character that is upon his love of truth and his desire to communicate without loss. The corruption of man is followed by the corruption of language. When simplicity of character and the sovereignty of ideas is broken up by the prevalence of secondary desires, the desires of riches, of pleasure, of power, and of praise, and duplicity and falsehood take place of simplicity and truth, the power over nature as an interpreter of the will is in a degree lost. The new imagery ceases to be created. And old words are perverted to stand for things which are not. Man is corrupted after language is corrupted, and it is corrupted in the absence of character and love of truth. That's what Emerson wrote. I get it. The founders from Jefferson to Madison to Marshall, they got it. John Locke and John Stuart Mill, they got it. The liberals got it, and the conservatives got it once upon a time. The Supreme Court left right valence from William Brennan to Antonin Scalia. Once upon a time, they all got it, too. Here's a unanimous Supreme Court statement from 1964. Quote, we consider this case against the background of a profound national commitment to the principle that debate on public issues should be uninhibited, robust, and wide open, and that it may well include vehement, caustic and sometimes unpleasantly sharp attacks on government and public officials, close quote. A culture only exists when it agrees on certain precepts, the first of which is, of course, language. And a constitution can constitute a people only so long as people believe in it. The entirety of the left is committed to people not believing in in the Constitution. Thus, the Constitution of we as a people and society is so riven and we are so at each other's throats. We don't agree on things anymore, including the Constitution, from the very basic meanings of words and the miracle of the common noun to the Constitution itself. We are a disintegrated society. Now, how odd a thing for language to be such a central feature, a mainstay, of culture and society, and for it to be limited by one ideologically biased perspective in a country that declares itself a republic, a democracy, with a First Amendment tied to its constitution that declares Congress shall make no law against the freedom of speech. But that is what we have here, a coup to install thought and thus language control, language control as well to control thought. Democracies and republics, non-tyrannies, were supposed to be uniquely gifted at their immunities against exactly these kinds of things as well as propaganda. So how to get around those immunities? Change the terms of the debate by changing the meanings of the terms in the debate. Inverting language. For too many Americans, this goes on unnoticed. Soon they will notice it when their schools start uniformly and you ubiquitously adopting the U.S. Department of Education standards on civics, described as proposing the reformation of civics instruction to, quote, support the development of culturally responsive teaching and learning, close quote. In the book Culturally Responsive Education, a primer for policy and practice, New York University professor David Kirkland explains that such pedagogy abandons assimilationist, assimilationist dictates, which center on, quote, Anglo-European Christian Judeo cis hetero male whiteness as the normative reference point, close quote. You think we could have even uttered that and know what it meant five years ago? Judeo, Christian Judeo cis hetero male whiteness. Boy, if I said that in my law school class. Just so, though, the Department of Education is incorporating the work of Ibram Kendi into their rules for grants to teach civics, specifically his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. 
In that book, Dr. Kendi writes, quote, there is no such thing as a not racist idea. There is no such thing as a non-racist or race-neutral policy. Not only is racism all-encompassing to Kendi, it also makes unceasing demands. All racist disparities demand an anti-racist response. Thus, Kendi's anti-racism rejects the very idea that something can exist outside its racial frame, Andrew Sullivan writes. There is no opting out. There is only confession. Quote, only racists say they're not racists, Kendi writes. In fact, quote, the most threatening racist movement is not the alt-right's unlikely drive for a white ethno state, but the regular Americans' drive for a race-neutral one, close quote. Got it? Race neutrality. Martin Luther King and the ethos of the 1964 Civil Rights Act are the most threatening movement in America. Kendi has recently argued for the adoption of an anti-racist amendment to the Constitution that would make racist ideas by public officials unconstitutional. Of course, Kendi has tagged particular views on taxation, pot, private health care, school testing, and more as racist, meaning that this would gut the First Amendment's free speech protections. Kendi appears wholly untroubled by that fact and So does Facebook and Twitter and corporate America. As Frederick Hess points out, we have been shut down rhetorically by the peremptory statement that only racists say they're not racist, as Kendi writes. We have been shut down rhetorically by the claims that when we argue we are engaging in whataboutism. We have been shut down rhetorically by the statements that every position we express is extreme. We have been shut down rhetorically by being told we all have implicit racism buried within us. We have been shut down rhetorically by being told we are racist. We have been shut down rhetorically by having leadership in our movement banned, censored, canceled, shut down, locked out of social media, while true extremists and racists thrive there without moment or shame. What is clear is we are trying to be marginal. What, what is clear is, they are try- is we are attempting to be marginalized. And what makes it so pernicious is that we aren't allowed to fight back or even share their language anymore. Illness, worry, crime, hate, envy. Those were the contents spilt on society from v- Pandora's vessel. We have gotten all that from the left. And it's getting worse. Let's do recall the last item in that vessel was, however, hope. I'm Seth Leibson. We will be right back. 